welcome to those of you joining us later on YouTube now as well. On the TCF side of things, I want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact me for more information on sponsoring, but you too can also help us keep these webinars free. When you close out of this webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in on our website. So our native plant guide, our conservation at home program, uh, rain barrel information, and so much more. But you'll also see a button there to make a donation. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help TCF continue to do all the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. So you can also check the, you can become a member or just make a donation. But if you become a member, then you'll also enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff. So upcoming webinars. Next week's going to be a really cool one. It's another one of our DuPage County sponsored ones, uh, Improving Soil Naturally. The Illinois Extension will be here to talk about things you can do to improve the soil in your own yard. February 24th, we're going to be joined by Amy Phillips, who's one of our TCF staffers, and she's going to be talking about a particular passion of hers, learn from nature, biomimicry. Now, you guys, I've heard her talk about this before. It's super cool. Biomimicry is the idea that we can solve our own architectural and engineering and, and all those kinds of problems by looking at nature. Super cool. She's got some really awesome examples. Definitely, definitely come check that one out. And we, I don't know that we've quite announced it yet, but because you're here, I'll tell you, March 3rd, we're going to be joined by Illinois botanizer Chris Benda, who's going to be talking about the hidden natural treasures of Illinois. Super, super excited about his talk too. He's an awesome speaker and I'm really looking forward to it. So make sure you join us for these upcoming webinars as well. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started talking about some uh, winter birds. Here we go. There we are. All right, so winter birds, that is my contact information up there. Please feel free to copy that down, jot it down if you have any questions that you wanna talk about later. All right. So a little bit, first of all, about the Conservation Foundation, since it's been a little while since I've talked to you all. We here at the Conservation Foundation, this is our goal. We want to improve the health of our communities. So we love birds, we love animals, we love plants, but it's all about protecting and, and preserving the health of everybody, us, the animals, the plants, everything. And we do that by protecting open space, protecting our water, and we are accredited, which you may or may not think that's a big deal, but there's a lot of stuff that we had to do to show that we're doing everything right. And, uh, you know, so it, it is actually, it's, it's a really big deal. So we're very proud of that. And it, it plays an important role in pres preserving our quality of life. So our water, you know, I like clean water. I like clean air. I like having habitat that I can go explore and see lots of animals like our winter birds today. And also to have space to get kids outside, right? We all know kids need to get outside, get away from those screens. Um, you know, they're spending so much time even in school now on screens, get them outside, get them playing. And that is our responsibility to future generations. All right, so let's take a look here. What do we have? So different types of feeders. So when you go to the store to buy a feeder, you're going to see all different types. And some are better in the summer, like your Oriole feeders. You really don't have, if you're here in the Midwest, you really don't have a need for an Oriole feeder this time of year because those birds just aren't here. So your standard mixed seed feeder, like you see there in the upper right, that's a perfect feeder to have out this time of year. It'll bring a wide variety of birds to your yard. It's perfect. Or the platform feeder, right? Like they're in the bottom right. So platform feeders, you can put any type of seed you want in there. Downside of those is you're gonna get more squirrels. You're gonna be feeding the squirrels along with the birds. If you don't mind that, that's fine. We got our suet bricks. So you want a little cage to keep your suet blocks in. Um, like you see, they're sort of in the middle left. Um, suet is a great thing to put out in the winter. We don't advise it in the summer because it has a tendency to spoil, 
but winter is perfect. It's got a nice high fat content for those birds. They need all that extra insulation to help keep them warm during these winter days. So having a suet block out like that is a great idea in the winter. Real easy to do too. You know, you just pop it in that little cage and hang it up somewhere. Um, I have had problems with raccoons and squirrels getting into them. So it may take a little, uh, a few attempts to outsmart them uh, as I had to do. I actually lost one of those cages last year. So a raccoon went, took, apparently just took it and ran off with it. Um, but, you know, just, we have big brains. We can outsmart these animals. So uh, do what you can to help outsmart them. Then on the left, you see there a peanut feeder. And those feeders are good for certain types of birds that like peanuts in the shell. So your woodpeckers, your nuthatches, um, we'll get into more of what birds like what, but having a uh, one of those kind of ring feeders, they call them, to put peanuts in is another great winter option for birds. And, you know, this is just a, a small handful of different types of feeders that are out there. There really are as, as many different types of feeders as you can imagine. So the big thing with them is whatever type of feeder you have, make sure you keep it clean because that'll help to keep the birds healthy as well. There's lots of bacteria and things that can build up in them, diseases that birds can get and pass on to each other through dirty feeders. So please do make sure that you're cleaning these feeders. Mild bleach solution, um, rinse them out really well, dry them, and then re refill them with your seed. All right, so this is a slide I put together for my summer bird talk. It's the birds that are here are pretty much going to be fairly uh, most of the same ones. So uh, let's take a look here. So seed mixes are for everybody. That's the nice thing about those seed mixes is you can feed a wide variety of different birds with one type of seed. So um, seed mixes are a great choice to bring a variety of birds to your yard. They vary in price depending on the composition of the seed, but it's a good choice. Sunflower seeds, these are the guys who like those sunflower seeds and you can either get them in the hull or out of the hull. Um, the benefit of buying them hulled already is that you don't have to worry about the waste. So as birds go in there, they break it open, they get that little seed out and then they drop the shell on the ground. So if it's in an area where you don't want that waste littering the ground, you might wanna think about getting the kind that's already been hulled. The downside is the stuff that's already been hulled is more expensive because the work has gone in to remove the hull. So again, upsides, downsides, you gotta balance your goals with, um, with your, your budget. Peanuts, another good choice. As we mentioned, that ring feeder is good for peanuts. These are the guys here who like those peanuts. Basically, finches will have a hard time getting in there. Their beaks are more for cracking open smaller seeds. They may have a harder time with the peanuts. But um, other than that, a lot of different birds like peanuts, especially your blue jays and your woodpeckers. Thistle seed. Now, this is going to get for more your, your smaller birds, so more of your finches and your sparrows. Um, that's that little black thistle, or sometimes it's called Niger seed. You need a special type of feeder that one of generally one of those tube feeders or a sock feeder, um, because the seeds are so small. In a standard feeder, they just sort of fall out. So, um, you're if you're going to use thistle, you want to have make sure you get the right type of feeder for that. Again, suet is a perfect thing for this time of year. You're going to definitely get your woodpeckers. Um, maybe blue jays. I haven't seen any blue jays on my uh, my suet, but um, nuthatches love suet, and so do juncos. I don't have a, a junco on here, but um, juncos probably the most prevalent bird I have in my yard right now, and they love suet feeders. Mealworms are really more of a spring thing, and we'll talk about why that is later. Um, but I just wanted to leave that in there too because there's a lot of different birds that will eat insects. Obviously, if you're here in the Midwest, there really aren't any insects and the birds sort of know it. So they switch their food preferences for what should be here right now. This is another recipe that I came across that I thought was really cool. And it's, it's sort of like suet, but not really. They call it bark butter. You can make it on your own. 
And the nice thing is you don't even really need a feeder for it. You can just sort of smear it on a tree branch um, or a tree trunk. And I've heard the birds go absolutely crazy for it. So this is on my to-do list for this weekend. I'm gonna make up some of this stuff. Um, and it's basically equal parts, lard, or you could probably use Crisco too, um, peanut butter, rolled oats. So just, you know, your usual Quaker oats. Um, and then unsalted sunflower seeds, but you could also put in just any kind of regular bird seed in with that too. And then a little bit of honey to go with it. Now you can also buy this pre-made if you don't wanna make your own. Um, Wild Birds Unlimited has it. I think I even saw it on Amazon. So any anywhere you buy stuff to feed the birds, I'm sure you could find this too, but it's an, a nice high fat mixture that the birds, you know, it's, it's got all the stuff the birds are looking for right now. Um, so there is an option for you as well. I came across this today and I had to share it. I like you more than bread, but I still, but can I still please have some bread? Please bread, now bread. Birds love bread as we all know, but it is really terrible for them. Um, especially animals like ducks and swans. You always see people with a loaf of bread out there throwing bread at them. It's really not good. It's, it fills them up a lot, but it's sort of like ice cream. So if you were to go and just eat nothing but ice cream, it'd be, it would taste really good and you would love it until you didn't. So it's, uh, it, there are lots of better choices of things that you can feed birds. If you wanna feed the ducks, um, crack corn is a great choice for ducks. Frozen peas is another good choice for ducks. Um, just not bread, please. Um, it can cause uh, nutritional deficiency issues with them. Um, there's something called angel wing where their wings sort of get deformed and they can't fly anymore. So um, lots of better choices to give your birds than bread. Water is another thing that you can offer the birds. However, in the winter here in the Midwest um, or other places where it gets cold, we wanna make sure we have a heated bird bath for them. So, um, so that they have liquid water to get at rather than a frozen block of ice. So there are plenty of different types of heated bird baths that you can buy. Um, these are, are just two choices that I found online. Um, but just if you are going to offer water, make sure it's, it's heated. So other things that your birds are going to want if you're setting up your own station is you're going to want some shelter for them. So having lots of shrubs and trees and things like that nearby is a good choice. So the trees and shrubs I'm going to show you are native to here in the Illinois region. If you are joining us from outside the Illinois region, check with your local wild ones or uh, National Wildlife Federation's got a uh, native plant finder. There's lots of different native plant finders out there, no matter where you're at. Quick Google search should give you plenty of information. You can also look up um, your local land trust. They may be able to help you as well. I'll have more information on that in a bit. So anyway, um, having shrubs that have a lot of structure like these, as well as some berries. So service berry and nanny berry will hold on to their uh, their berries, and that's a really good source of food for the birds in the fall and winter. Um, I, I put eastern hemlock on here because I, I know we like having evergreens. There really aren't great choices for evergreens here in the Midwest, unfortunately, um, or at least here in the Chicago region. If you go further up into Wisconsin, there's plenty of, of evergreens that are native up there, but here in the Chicago region, there, there just really aren't any great choices. Our soil, our soil is too heavy with clay and, you know, they'll do okay for a while and then they won't. So there's plenty of other native choices that will give you some really good structure as well as providing food for the birds as well. Other choices, winterberry, crab apples, and oaks. Um, I heard those of you who know Dr. Doug Tallamy, always, we always recommend oaks because of the amount of food they provide for everyone. Um, he was saying that blue jays are actually one of the creatures that spread acorns for oak trees, even more so than squirrels. We always think of squirrels taking the nuts and hiding them. Blue jays apparently move them just as well. So oaks are a great 
winter source of food for birds, as well as crab apples and winterberry. Honeysuckle and buckthorn, those are two big invasive species here in the Chicago region. They are very bad for birds. Those of you who may have buckthorn in your yard or have seen it, know it does hold on to those blackberries throughout the winter. It's not a preferred food source for the birds, but that's a good thing because it's also a diuretic for them as well. So it dehydrates them and, and really makes them sick and, and is one of the factors that's driving issues with songbirds. So we really wanna make sure we get that honeysuckle and that buckthorn out of our yards and get those native species in there. All right, so why do we talk so much about native species? Wherever you are joining us from today, plant native. Let's get away from the European this and the Japanese that because the native stuff is what really helps to support our birds. So we plant, you know, this is a, obviously a summer picture, but we plant our native things that leads to caterpillars and insects and, and other things that use this. And then our birds, that's what they're feeding their young in the spring. So I notice in the spring and early summer, I, I don't see as many birds around my feeders as I do in the winter and the fall. Why is that? It's because they've switched their diet to caterpillars. That's what they feed their babies. It's a lot easier to stuff a caterpillar down the throat of a baby than it is to stuff some seeds. So by having those native plants, that's the best way we can support our local birds. And of course, that also helps to feed those other birds that maybe we don't like to think about so much, but they're so cool. And they're a necessary part of the ecosystem too. So definitely, definitely plant natives. They also save us time and money because they're used to being here. They're used to our growing conditions. They require less maintenance than do some of the exotic species that are here. So plant natives to support our birds. And with your native plants, don't tidy up in the fall. This is a great excuse to be lazy in the fall because all these plants provide food for the birds here in the winter as well. So leave your coneflower seed heads standing, leave your joe pieweed seeds standing, your coreopsis, all of these provide seed for the birds, but those insects that are feeding them in the spring, there are some insects that overwinter inside the hollow stems of these plants as well. So you're supporting the pollinators as well as the birds by leaving these standing. So leave these guys up. I know it can be kind of depressing to look out and see all these dead plants standing up there. And, and early in the spring when it starts to warm up and we really wanna work in our yards, it's the first thing we wanna do is go cut everything down. But I'm telling you, wait, just wait and let those insects finish their life cycle. Let the birds get those last seeds out of there so that we can, we can keep this cycle going. So some tools that you're gonna need if you're going to be looking for birds, you wanna look for binoculars. So you want a decent pair of binoculars. And this is, if you can afford it, this is the place to you know, get a really decent pair because this is, this is what's going to contribute to your enjoyment of the birds. So get a decent pair of binoculars um, what do you want to look for? Well, you got, first thing to look at is there's always that pair of numbers with those binoculars. And so the first number is the magnification. So how many times bigger that thing is going to look than if you were looking at it with your na naked eye. So the best you want to look for between seven and 10 X um, for your magnification. The second number is the lens diameter in millimeters. So the bigger that second number is, the bigger that lens is gonna be. Bigger lens means more light, but it also means it's gonna be heavier. So if you're planning on hiking a lot and carrying these things around your neck, which they make these harnesses that kind of go over your shoulders. If you're, if you're planning on being out a lot, invest in one of those. It'll make things so much easier on your neck. Um, but as long as you stay between seven and 10 X for the magnification, between 30 and 42 millimeters, that's going to be your, your probably your best basic pair of binoculars. And try them out. If you can get out into a store, 
and try them out before you buy them. You want to make sure they're comfortable. You want to make sure they fit around your eyes and aren't, you know, too offset. Everybody's face is shaped differently. So binoculars are going to fit a little bit different. If you wear glasses, that's another thing to take into account. Make sure you're going to be able to use them without your glasses or with your glasses. Make sure they're going to be comfortable on your eyes. So definitely take a look. So, and again, as you can see in that diagram there, lower magnification means you're going to have a wider field of view. So it's going to be easier to find the things that you're looking for, but you're not going to be able to see them quite as close up as you would otherwise. So with the higher magnification, it might be a little bit trickier to, to find exactly what that thing you just think you saw was, but you're going to be able to see it a little bit more crisply. So lots of things to take into consideration here. There's pros and cons to both ways. Try them out. Find a pair that you like before you um, drop money on them because they can, they can get kind of expensive, but um, you can still get a decent pair without breaking the bank. You're also going to want a good field guide. With apps, there are some fabulous apps. I love Cornell Labs Merlin app. For beginner birders, it is absolutely perfect. With it, it, by answering just a couple of questions on there, easy questions about what's today's date, where did you see it, what was it doing, and what were the main colors on it, it'll give you a list of potential choices for it. Super easy to use. And even if you're not really sure where to begin, it will help. Seek by iNaturalist is another really good one that you can use. And, and it, it uses crowdsourcing, which is pretty cool because that you can use more experienced birders to help you come up with a more definitive answer as to what you saw. If you are more of the paper book and, and guide kind of person, I love Birds of Illinois if you can find it. Um, it's nice because it's, for me here in Illinois, having a guide that just lists birds that are local to me means I'm not flipping through the giant Sibley book and go, oh, I think that's what I saw. Oh, wait, no, they're only in Vermont or, you know, that bird hasn't been seen here in 50 years. So it's probably not that. So it's, it's just a, a, it's a shorter list to go through if you can find a, a bird book that is local to you. But, caveat, when you are out birding, don't bird with your head in a book because that's no fun. So the best thing to do is actually study these books ahead of time before you're going to go out. Page through them. Read about the books. Read about the differences between the different types of birds that you might see so that you can tell when you go out, is that a chickadee or is that a nuthatch? Oh, wait, I remember I read that. Rather than okay, and then look down at your book, and then, okay, grab something out, because you're going to miss the birds. You want to be there to enjoy the birds, so maybe jot some notes down, but don't bird with your head in a book. All right, so let's start talking about some of the birds that we might see in our backyards. Again, here, I'm, I'm basing this in the Chicago area, things that I see here in my backyard. If you are joining us from other places in the United States or Canada or wherever you're joining us from. Maybe you have some of these same birds as well. Maybe not. So uh, Cardinal is, it's really sort of the eponymous winter bird, right? There is nothing like that striking red against the white snowy background. And they are everywhere. I have seen pictures people have posted recently of, you know, a dozen Cardinals sitting in a tree by their house. It's amazing. Um, there's lots of lore that goes along with cardinals. I know my grandmother always used to think that um, when she saw a cardinal, it was a deceased relative who was coming back to say hi to her. Um, you know, it, and it's just, they're, they're everywhere. They're such a sweet bird, and I love hearing their songs in the spring. Um, they like woodland edge areas, so if you've got those shrubs in your yard, that will also help to attract them. Um, and I thought this was kind of a cool uh, little fun fact that the cardinal is the official state bird in seven different states, uh, including here in Illinois. Dark-eyed juncos. These are our visitors from the north. So those of you, if you're joining us from Canada, are probably very familiar with these little guys. They are winter visitors here in Illinois. 
So we always think of snowbirds being those that, you know, leave here and go to warmer climates. Juncos come from even colder places and come down here for the winter. Okay, I, I mean, I would pick Florida, but you know, that's just me. So they spend their time up in uh, breeding areas are up in Canada. Very easy to spot though, because they have that really dark slate colored top and that real light colored belly. They have been all over my feeders. They love my suet feeder. They love my seed feeders. They are just everywhere. Um, regionally, they can have a little bit of color variation. So maybe learn what they look like in your area. Um, they can have little bits of brown on their wings, uh, be lighter or darker. Um, in the winter, they're primarily seed eaters. During breeding season, they like to eat bugs like a lot of birds, but um, they are primarily seed eaters in the winter. So they like open fields, parks, backyards, pretty much anywhere. They eat off the ground, they eat on feeders. They are just pretty much everywhere here in the winter. Nut hatches. So we have two different kinds of nut hatches that you may see here, uh, but we have the white breasted nut hatch and the red breasted nut hatch. Um, I picked a photo that was very clear that had a lot of that orange on the belly. Sometimes that orange is not quite so bright but you can always tell, you see that white line they have going right across their eye. That white line is a great indication that you've got a red-breasted nut hatch there. Um, if you take a look at their beak shape, that's another thing we look at when we're trying to identify birds. You see they have that kind of long, narrow, pointed beak. Um, the other thing that you can use to identify a nut hatch that, that's pretty easy to uh, they do it a lot, and they're one of the few birds that will do it, is they will actually hop head first down a tree. So if you see them clinging to a tree trunk, they will go down it head first. Not many birds hang upside down kind of like that. So, um, but that's, that's pretty characteristic of a nuthatch. Um, scientists think they may mate for life. They're not entirely certain, but they think they do. And they will take seeds from your feeder to some tree with maybe some loose bark or something and shove those seeds in the bark. I've seen pictures of a, they call them a pantry or a larder where you just see all these sunflower seeds shoved into crevices and cracks in a tree. So they are one of the ones that will do that. And that's their, you know, just kind of saving them for later. Woodpeckers. So woodpeckers come out a lot during the winter because they're looking for seeds. So even though we may not see them as much at our feeders during the spring and summer, they will be here for the winter. They love suet. That bark butter would also be another, uh, another favorite food for them. So we've got a couple of different kinds of woodpeckers here that are, are common, a few that are less common. Um, I put the Northern Flicker in there because I just love them. They're so pretty, they're so speckly um, and their call it, it reminds me of jungle noises. Like they sound like a monkey to me because they have just this loud, almost not quite machine gun, I wouldn't call it, but repeating, uh, you know, kind of squeaky. Like I said, it sounds monkey like to me. So um, flickers definitely remind me of jungle sounds. Red bellied woodpeckers, again, they also have a very distinctive call. Um, and then downy and hairy woodpeckers look very, very similar. They can be very difficult to tell apart. Um, as a matter of fact, there are numerous articles online telling you how to tell them apart. Um, and, and I'm still trying to figure it out myself. This size is the, the biggest indication. Hairy woodpeckers are much larger than downy. So once you have a handle on the size comparisons, you can look at them and kind of know which one it is. Uh, the other thing you can look at, though, is their beaks. So if you look at the beaks on the two pictures that I have here, you see the one on the right has a much smaller beak in comparison to the size of its head. The one on the left has a much larger beak. So the hairy woodpecker is the larger one that has the much larger, broader beak. Downy woodpecker, its beak is maybe half the size of its head. Whereas the hairy woodpecker, the beak is almost the same size as its head. So that's one way you can help to tell the two of them apart. 
Um, there's also things with uh, speckling on the tail and you can find lots of pictures online if, if you look. Again, it may just be enough to know, hey, that's a woodpecker. I put cedar wax wings on here too, because this is another one of my favorite birds. They are so, so pretty, um, so photogenic, I think too. I just love how they have, it, it looks like little paint drops on their, their wings and on their tail. They're just, they're, I, I think of them as being kind of cardinal shaped. They're about the size and shape of a cardinal. They have that crest on their head. Um, in the, the summer, they eat a lot of insects. Uh, in the winter, they will eat berries, uh, maybe some seed. You don't often see them at feeders though, but you will hear them. I was hearing cedar wax wings long before I actually knew that's what I was hearing. Their call sounds like a dog whistle. It's a single note, very, very high pitched, just like somebody blew on a dog whistle. And so they're, they like to hang out in the tops of evergreen trees or sometimes even hardwood trees too, but um, they hang out high up in the treetop. So a lot of times you hear them more than you will see them. But they also love berries. And when the male is courting the female, one of the things they will do is they will go find a berry and bring it to the female and they will pass her the berry. And then sometimes she passes it back and they'll pass it back and forth a little bit. And that's just kind of their thing. And I think that's just adorable. So cedar wax wings, you know, fun Valentine's Day kind of thing. So very fun bird. And I guess that black mask, very, very distinctive. You will know when you see these guys. Finches. Now finches can be very hard to tell apart. Um, get a sense of the size and the shape of them and you can narrow down the family to say, yep, that's a finch. If you can go even further than that to tell which finch it is, that's awesome. So, but it, again, if you're just a beginner, it may be enough just to say, hey, I saw a finch today. Um, purple finches are here in the Chicago region, mostly for the winter. They're another one that spend their summers mostly north of here and then come down for the winter. They eat lots of bugs, but they also like sunflower seeds. So if you have those black oil sunflower seeds in your feeder, there's a good chance um, that you will get some finches in there. House finch is not native to the Chicago region. They were released here by pet shop owners in the 1940s. Basically, they would catch them out west, bring them to the pet shops, and then at some point it was made illegal to sell them because people were letting them go and they were kind of creating havoc. So um, pet shop owners who didn't want to be caught with them just released them. So now they're here. They eat seeds, they eat flower buds, um, some insects, but again, they love those black oil sunflower seeds. So we may get them here. I find these two very hard to tell apart and I'm, I'm really doing my best to learn the differences. If you look on the house finch, you will see these black and white stripes down here on their flanks. This one, no stripes. It's all just sort of red and white. If you can see that part of them, that's one way to tell. There's also more purple on the wings here and on the house finch, it's mostly just black and white. Again, there's so much color variation in them. It's not always as straightforward as you might think. And sometimes you only get the briefest glimpse of them. So knowing where you're looking and what you're looking for will help you ID them later. I call these confusers because these are two others that I have a really hard time telling apart. I'm working on it though. Goldfinches. I've heard so many people say, oh, we don't have goldfinches here in the winter. Yes, we do. You just didn't recognize them because they didn't have their summer clothes on. Goldfinches lose that bright yellow coloring in the winter because oh, they don't need it. It's for breeding, it's for attracting females. If they're not doing that activity, which they're not in the winter, doesn't matter. So they lose that bright yellow coloring so they blend in much better. This is another one that loves those thistle and niger seeds. So those are great. Um, you can expect to have these guys if you have a thistle feeder out. Um, and when you watch them fly, I always say it looks kind of like a roller coaster motion because, you know, if you, if you imagine going on a roller coaster where it goes up and then down and then up and then down, 
that's the pattern that these guys fly in. So if you see a bird that's going up and down and up and down in the air, it's probably a goldfinch. Now, pine siskins are one, another one that spends their summers up north. And every now and then we have what's called an eruptive year. Uh, and what that means is many times these guys will stay in Canada and they won't come down this way at all. However, sometimes based on food sources, if this isn't a particularly good year for, uh, I was reading what they eat up in Canada and I, it's uh, seeds off of like pine cones and some of the like birch trees, maybe something like that. If it's not a particularly good year for those, they'll venture further south to find more food. So this year happens to be an eruptive year and people are seeing uh, pine siskins just in droves down here. Um, one of the, in my opinion, one of the great places to help you learn birds better is if you're on Facebook, join a birding group for your area. Here in the Chicago region, there are a couple of birding groups. One is run by the Audubon Society. Um, one is a general wildlife group, but it gets a lot of bird pictures too. Um, and so you'll get a sense of what's in your area at that time of year. And people post just some of the most beautiful pictures because everybody likes sharing their pretty pictures of birds. Um, you'll find out what's, you'll get a better sense of what's in the area and you've got somebody identifying it for you. So the more you look at these pictures, the more it'll just get locked in your brain. So definitely. And you know, then your Facebook feed is filled with beautiful pictures of birds and animals instead of political nonsense. So there you go. Um, but that's where I learned this year is an eruptive year for these pine siskins. And they will hang out um, in, in large numbers around feeders. Um, and you can see they're a little bit more streaky than the goldfinches. But again, you, get, you have to know that that's what you're looking for. Um, they also have a little more yellow on the wings you can see here as opposed to the goldfinches, which are generally just black and white wings. Sparrows. Basically, what can I say about sparrows? Good luck. <laughs> um, sparrows can be very hard to tell apart. Um, this, is, this is one where studying ahead of time might be a way to be able to tell them apart. Um, and yeah, you know, patterning on the head, color of the beak, streaking on the belly. Um, you know, all of these are different ways to tell them apart, but there's a lot of them. So you got to be able to um, either take notes and remember them to look them up later, or, you know, maybe make flashcards. Or, as I've said before, just say, yep, that's a sparrow. So, good luck. Okay, these guys. Starlings, cowbirds, and grackles. These guys like to form large flocks. And they will hang out in the treetops around dusk. They will invade your feeders and eat you out of house and home. Um, yeah, they're, they're interesting birds. So, and, and I find it interesting that they create mixed species flocks. So starlings come from Europe, their story, uh, back in the 1890s, there was a group of Shakespeare enthusiasts who decided it would be really cool to get two of each bird that Shakespeare mentioned in his plays and release them in New York Central Park. They did that. Some of them didn't survive. Some of them did survive and have gone on to become very, very invasive, including the European starling. This is their winter coat. In the summer, they're not quite as speckly. Um, I had kids refer to them as star birds because they look like they have stars all over their bodies. Um, but yeah, it's a starling. Their feathers are kind of iridescent, which is pretty cool. Um, and they make these really bizarre whistles and squeaks and gurgly kinds of calls. Apparently they can imitate other birds as well, which is kind of fun. Um, in the summer, they eat a lot of insects 
um, but in the winter and fall, they eat berries and seeds. So they love feeders. They are not shy about feeders and a big group of them will come in and chase other things off your feeder. So um, grackles, again, same thing. They will eat everything. They're, they're kind of pretty. The head makes their, their, or this photo makes their head look really blue. That's only in the right light. Their, their head, the feathers on their head are really iridescent. And so in certain light, it will appear blue. In other light, they may look entirely black. Brown-headed cowbird. This is an interesting bird. I have sort of a love-hate relationship with them because they are nest parasites. Uh, their story is they used to follow the buffalo herds or the bison herds, sorry. They used to follow the bison herds across North America. When you are following a bison herd, you don't have time to put down roots and build a nest and, and raise a family you got to keep moving. So what they would do is they will lay their eggs in other birds' nests, sometimes kicking out um, other eggs, or um, their young grow very quickly and will effectively starve out the young of their uh, nest mates. And they are also very aggressive and they're just kind of nasty birds. But you got to give them credit for the ingenuity of that because you know it's what they do. So, you know, there's there's a great uh, moral and philosophical discussion I've read about them, and I can't hate them, but it's it's frustrating because, like I said, flocks of all of these guys will come in, chase your other birds away, and eat you out of house and home. All right, little less common are our owls. If you are very lucky, winter is a good time to see owls. Great horned owls especially are nesting around now, which means they're calling a lot, so you may start to hear them call more frequently. Great horned owls make that standard ubiquitous hoo hoo kind of call. Um, you know, the, the call, the kind of call if somebody in a cartoon says or is out at night, that's what you're gonna hear. Um, barred owls, on the other hand, they like it a little more wooded. So if you live adjacent to a forest preserve maybe, or um, in a more heavily wooded area, you may hear a barred owl. Their call is very cool too. It, they actually, the, the mnemonic to remember that their call is who cooks for you. So that's what their call sounds like. Snowy owls come down here sometimes this far for winter, they can be very tricky to find. Uh, they are also one of the very heavily guarded secrets about where they're located. Um, people frequently report seeing them flying over farm fields, or if you have like large prairies such as Medewin, um, those are, are areas where you would be more likely to see a snowy owl. Um, I know north of here in like Lake County and some, and some places like that, they see them much more frequently. We don't get a lot of reports of them here in Will County, um, but you know, you never know. Sometimes they just come down here, who knows why, but um, that's where you might find a snowy owl. I have not seen one yet. It is on my bucket list to find a snowy owl. So if you know where there is a snowy owl and you want to share that with me, uh, talk to me later. <laughs> now, one of the cool things that we can do in winter is fun tracking things. So those of you who have, uh, you know, have done animal tracking, who, you know, can recognize a deer print or a rabbit track, snow provides one of those interesting times that we can see birds as well. Um, owls and hawks can do this. I have heard that there, that owls can hear a mouse's heartbeat underneath the snow. So that's why you will see prints like this. And that is literally an owl or a hawk or something came flying over, dive bomb down into the snow. You see those little indentations left by the wings. And because, well, you know, who knows if, if their prey managed to get away or not, but um, it's kind of fun. I, I've seen these referred to as snow angels before, but, um, you know, and sometimes you'll see a big pile of feathers or fur next to it. Um, but 
these can be very fun finds in the snow as well. And thank you, photo credit on the left there. As I mentioned, these Facebook groups are great for seeing pictures of things. Uh, Lisa was kind enough to let me use her photo off of the Will County Wildlife website or a Facebook page uh, because I just thought that was such a cool picture that she had there. All right, so this and, and many of the other things we're doing is all part of our conservation at home program. So we want you to get out and enjoy your yard, enjoy seeing these birds, planting your native plants so that you can attract more birds and wildlife to your property. And we've got over a thousand certified properties in the Chicago region. If you're interested in joining our conservation at home program, drop me a line. Uh, and Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will County, let me know and I will get you to the right person. If you are outside of our core service area, you, here are some of the other people that you can contact about getting your yard certified. Um, if you're outside of that, as I mentioned before, you can go to findalandtrust.org to find your nearest local land trust. And if you wanna get more involved with the Conservation Foundation, you can become a member. As I mentioned before, you can visit our McDonald Farm in Maperville or our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Both very cool places, lots of really interesting things to check out, self-guided tours that you can take around there. Um, you can follow us on social media and then you'll find out more about webinars and what we've got going on. Um, and you can get your yard certified as well. So I always like ending with a little comic. So I thought this one was kind of cute. All right. So let's get to some of the questions that you had here. All right, Katie asked, can we make certificates for us that say we attended? Generally we don't because these are free and, and we don't adhere to any kind of standards, but if you, if you will get an email afterwards um, thanking you for attending, if that's not enough, contact me and I will see what I can do for you. Um, yeah, my name and email address are right there, Kathleen. Um, so on the bark butter recipe, somebody, uh, people were asking, can we sub bacon fat or coconut oil? Um, you probably could. I don't, I, I don't really see why not. I, I think either of those, you know, it, it's all fat. I, I would think the only hesitation with bacon fat is bacon contains a lot of nitrates, which, you know, while not being great for us are also not great for animals. So, um, I might hesitate on using bacon fat. Um, coconut oil should be fine though. Uh, beef fat is frequently used. Um, you know, a little bit of bacon fat in there is probably not gonna be the end of the world, but I wouldn't use it a ton. Jan says, I should assume squirrels like the bark butter too. I would think they would. Um, so, you know, and, and probably the raccoons as well. Um, Annette wants to know how to prevent starlings who have taken over the suet platform feeder and hopper feeder. <sighs> Good luck. Um, I don't, I, other than taking the food in, if you take the food in, that may encourage them to move on. And then once they've moved on, you can put it back out again and hope they have found another food source to take over. Um, that would, that's, you hear that recommendation also if you've got hawks that are, you know, that have taken up residence around your feeders, um, you know, just kind of hope they've moved on at that point. That's what I would do. Dana wants to know what's happened to all the nut hatches this year. Used to see so many at feeders, but this year hasn't seen any at all. So it's interesting because it may just be they've got another food source nearby. I've got tons of nut hatches. Um, at my feeders, they and the juncos have been all over my suet this year. So um, some years, animal populations tend to go in cycles. So some years we'll get an explosion of them and then other years, not as many. Um, it, like I said, it could be that they found other food sources. It could be that they're, um, that this is just a, a lower population in your area right now um, this year for whatever reason maybe the you know uh, maybe the oak trees are 
you know, have a, a lower number of acorns this year. When some, there are some years where oak trees will have just an explosion of acorns, they call that a mast year. Um, but then there's the opposite of that as well. And I'm not sure of the term for that, but they also have years where they don't produce as many acorns. All of that might feed into the number of nut hatches. I'm not entirely certain. I think it's, it, it's probably just that they're just going someplace else right now. I don't know. Uh, Mary Ellen wants to know, when, you, when should you cut back flowers? Uh, your native plants, your flowers and grasses, I would wait until the insects are out. So you can either wait until you are seeing more insects out and flying around, um, or I have also heard like the, what, second week of May, at least in, here in the Chicago region, because um, then most things have um, come out of, of wherever they're overwintering. All right. How popular are yellow-bellied sapsuckers? Well, that could depend on where you are at. Um, I do know that they are here. You see their holes. Their holes are very cool because it'll be like straight lines of little tiny holes. And it almost looked like somebody just drilled right into a tree, maybe six times in a row, and then went and made another row beneath it. Uh, I, you're not going to see them at your feeders. They are, they are drilling into trees and, and doing their thing in more heavily wooded areas. Like I said, I know they're here because I've seen their holes, but it's not the kind of thing you're gonna necessarily see at your feeders so much. Uh, Mary Ellen says, I'll have days go by with no birds coming to my feeder, then one day they all come at once. Why is that? Great question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. My guess would be that it could have to do with weather. Um, sometimes, like if we're going to get bad storms or something, they can feel that and they will take shelter and not be out at the feeders that day. Um, or if it's like super cold, they may just be hunkered down. Um, it could just be that they're, you're not on their rotation that day. Uh, you know, maybe they've got another food source. They're at your neighbor's house that day or something. Um, I'm, I'm not really, there's probably a, a wide variety of, of reasons why. Uh, those are the ones that kind of jump to mind. Um, how do you know if thistle seed is spoiled? That's a good question. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, generally when seed gets spoiled, it has a bad odor to it. Um, You know, if you if you're seeing any mildew, if it's caking at all, sometimes that's a bad sign with seed. Um, or, or like I said, you're seeing mildew on it or things. Then I would get rid of it. Um, generally, seed does have a fairly long shelf life, though. I think um, as long as it stays dry and and you're keeping your feeder clean. Do hawks eat other birds? I have a few hawks that hang out and chase things into the bushes. Absolutely, um, especially Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawks are not are one of the few hawks that are not afraid to go crashing through the woods chasing birds. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll give you a little story here. Um, I had a Cooper's hawk in my gazebo one year. I had a screened in gazebo and I went to let the dog out about 10 o'clock at night and I hear this commotion in my gazebo and there is a hawk sitting on my my chair what in the heck so I opened the door and I managed to you know go on to one side and get him to fly out the door and then I saw he had gone head first through my screen so my guess is he was chasing a bird and the bird veered off and he didn't see and he went head first right through that screen he was fine uh you know no worse for the wear but um, yeah, they will absolutely go chasing other birds. So your bird feeder may actually be feeding birds that you weren't quite intending. Um, so yeah, uh, red tails, um, Cooper's hawks, they'll catch whatever they can, they can get. Uh, Elizabeth says, has the bald eagle population expanded in the DuPage Kane County area over the past few years? I've been seeing a couple this year. Yes, they have, Liz. Um, 
after, you know, in the 1970s, we had the issue with them um, on the endangered species list because of DDT. Since DDT was banned and those issues have been resolved, they have, their populations have really made a huge comeback. So by protecting our waters, um, eliminating the use of lead shot is big and lead weights and sinkers and fishing. That's a big thing because um, fish ingest that and then the eagles ingest the fish and now the eagles end up with lead poisoning because of the things that they ate. So by eliminating things like lead shot and um, lead weights and fishing, that has helped the bald eagle population to really rebound. Um, and yeah, they're all over DuPage Cane. I've seen them here in Will, along the Fox River, you know, huge populations. If you go to Starved Rock in uh, Western Illinois, you'll see tons of them. So um, yeah, definitely. I say Western Illinois, I mean, West of me, anything West of me. Anyway, um, so yeah, tons and tons of eagles around here now. Uh, Reba says, we have a mockingbird for the first time ever. It's chasing off all the other birds. Are they normal central Illinois birds? Um, I think it's a little unusual. I don't think it's unheard of. Um, it's not something I've seen a lot of, so I don't know. I'd, ha I'd have to look into that. I'm not super familiar with them. Uh, yeah, Katie says she rarely finds them. So yeah, I don't know. They're, they're, they're definitely not common. I'll say that. Um, can wild birds eat unhulled whole grains like rye, oats, and wheats? Yes, they can. Uh, they can they've got those really sharp, uh, strong little beaks. Uh, we compare, you can almost compare them to a plate, uh, like a pair of pliers where they can, they can just crack uh, the seed coats right off of that. So uh, yeah, sunflower seeds, same way, any, any of those are fine. Um, Deb says, I've had so many robins the last three weeks. It seems very unusual. You know, it's kind of funny. Robins, everybody always thinks of robins as going away for the winter, but um, partly because of climate change has, has uh, it's, it's been warmer in this area than it used to be. And, and you know, I'm not, and probably partly because of, of feeders, um, robins don't all go away for the winter here. They, um, it's not uncommon to find small flocks of them around. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen a ton of them this winter, but it's not uncommon to see them around here at all. In fact, if you're, if you're like me and always looking for that, that harbinger of spring, for me, it's more the red-winged blackbirds. When I start to hear the red-winged blackbirds, I know spring is, is here. They're, they're, to me, they're my spring is here bird. Uh, Jill says, I did stop feeding briefly last summer and the grackles gave up and moved on. So there you go. That's, yeah, that, I have heard that works wonders if you're having issues like that. Susanna said, I live in an apartment. What's the best type of feeder I can use for my balcony? I see birds singing on my balcony every morning. Oh, very cool. So this brings up something that, that I didn't really mention before, but if you're looking at different types of seed, there, this is another one that has sort of a pros and cons sort of thing here. You can buy the higher quality, uh, no waste seed. Generally, the cheaper bird seeds that you get will have things in them like a lot of Milo, which is not a preferred food for birds, but it's really inexpensive. So a lot of places will throw in a heavy Milo content, which bulks up the content of the seed, but the birds will just pick it out and throw it on the ground. So if you want to waste less, spend more money, get a high quality, higher quality bird seed, they'll go through it slower because they're not kicking out all the garbage and you'll get better birds at your feeders. So I would recommend just a standard mixed seed type of feeder, depending on the types of birds that you want to attract and just get a higher quality. Some, sometimes if you go really, really high quality, it'll have things in it like dried cherries and dried cranberries. That'll bring in some really nice birds. But again, it's a little more expensive. 
So uh, it's sort of a toss up there, but um, I would say you really can't go wrong. You could even get a Niger uh, thistle seed feeder if you wanted to go that route too. Either of those would be fine on a, on a balcony. Uh, Debbie wants to know, when should we start putting mealworms in our feeders in Kankakee County? Um, I would say when you start to see those spring birds, um, you know, when, you know, definitely you can do it any time. They're probably not going to be eating them so much until a little bit later, uh, maybe late March, early April. I would say would be a good time. That's because that's when we start seeing our spring birds here. Uh, Eileen wants to know, do you refrigerate it? I'm not sure what you're referring to. If we're talking about the bark butter, you wouldn't have to refrigerate it. I don't think normally suet and things can be left at room temperature. Um, refrigerating it would just help it to be a little bit harder. But if it's softer, it would be more spreadable on your tree trunks. So I don't think it would need to be, I don't think that would need to be refrigerated if that's what you're referring to. Uh, Michelle says, we've had a lot of Cooper's hawks lately that aren't flying away from humans, able to walk up within a couple feet of them. Is that normal? It seems odd. It was cool, but concerning. Generally not. Um, they should generally be a little more shy of people um, unless they're injured. And then, you know, if they're injured, they may not be able to um, or it's possible that they're just becoming more conditioned to people, which again is not great either. So uh, definitely wouldn't encourage it if you, it, you know, if you can. Um, and if it seems like they're having any issues, if you notice any issues with the eyes, uh, missing feathers, things like that, uh, you may want to get in touch with a rescue, um, depending on where you're at. You know, in this area, Willowbrook Wildlife Center, or there's a number of, of raptor rescues. Chicago Bird Collision Monitors is another great one too. Uh, Carol says safflower is worth a try for starlings. Okay, definitely if you wanted if you wanted to try that. Uh, Teresa says I just looked at my bird feeders to see what, what was out there. A stinking hawk looking for dinner. Yep, they absolutely will do that for sure. Um, oh, bark butter recipe. I can put up the bark butter recipe again. Here. There we go. Okay, so there's the bark butter recipe again. Um, what makes a garden certified? And that says so certified is a uh, the conservation at home certification is a program that we run and we will come out and walk around your yard with you, talk about native plants. If you're looking for ideas or maybe you have everything and it's all ready to go, um, we look for a variety of native plants. We look for, um, you know, you're controlling any invasive species that are there. You're not overusing chemicals in your yard, that kind of thing. So if you're interested, if you've got native plants in your yard, give us a call and we'd be happy to talk to you about certification. You can find more information. Again, when you close out of this webinar, you'll be on uh, a, what, our website and there's more information on there about the Conservation at Home program. Uh, Margaret asked about fruit. Um, not sure exactly what, uh, what you're talking about there. Birds will definitely eat fruit. If you put it out there, you know, they like um, dried cherries, dried cranberries are always favorites fresh fruit this time of year probably not so much you're probably going to get more raccoons and things like that if that's the case um, but you know in the spring and summer putting out oranges will attract orioles to your yard so and they're one of my favorites I had tons of orioles this year for the first time um, orioles and catbirds were all over the oranges that I put out this year or this past year do most birds eat cicadas I don't know about most birds, but I know there are definitely some that will. If you are in one of the areas that will be having that great big uh, cicada year, this area is not. We've got a couple years to go until our 17-year cicadas, but um, there are a lot of birds that will. Birds 
when they're going for insects, they really like caterpillars. Caterpillars are a little bit softer going down. They don't have that hard exoskeleton. They're very high in nutrients. Um, so probably more so than cicadas, but they definitely will eat. A lot of birds will eat cicadas too. Uh, Reva says, seeing several robins here in central Illinois too, what can I put out for them? Um, gener see, generally we think of robins as being insect eaters and not so much seed. So I can see them maybe being underneath a feeder. I'm, I'm not sure what you would put out for robins. I don't generally think about feeding robins because they're not generally ones that will come to feeders like that. I'd have to look into that. Oh, Chris says grapes. Okay, I could see them maybe eating grapes if you want to throw some grapes out there. Um, Terrence says, are you guys seeing all those robins up there? We're seeing tons of them in Louisiana. I haven't seen them in a while, so we're all excited. We also did not see cardinals as often after Katrina, but they're starting to come back. I have a pear in my yard now, but my oak tree is full of robins. That's pretty cool. I like, you know, I, I normally think of most of our robins heading south you know, Louisiana, Florida, uh, definitely down where it's a lot warmer. Um, but we do have some that stay here. Definitely not as many as we get in the spring and summer, but we do definitely see robins up here too. Uh, Scott says, I've had nut hatches visit my nut and mixed seed feeders every day this winter. Yep, I've got them all over my mixed seed feeders too. Um, and it's so funny to watch them. They'll come, they'll take one seed and they'll go flying off with it you know they're putting it somewhere and then they come back and get another. So yeah, nut, ha nut hatches absolutely love feeders. So um, Carol says upside down suet feeders can also help with starlings. So yeah, I'm trying to think of, I'd have to look at, at designs on that. I haven't seen any of those, but then again, I also haven't had an issue with uh, starlings on my suet feeders though. Shelly wants to know, are screech owls here in the winter? Yes, I believe they are. Uh, depends on, on where here is for you. We don't have too many of them here in Will County. Um, I have certainly never seen one, but I know they are in the area and, th and they don't go anywhere for the winter. They stay here. Uh, how common are red-shouldered hawks in DuPage County? Um, they are definitely there. I, I, I don't know exact distribution or, or population numbers, but, um, you know, and especially when you get to the, some of the less common hawks, you know, everybody knows red tails, red shouldered and sharp shinned. I have a hard time telling apart. Um, and I know they are less common than red tails, but, you know, they are definitely here. Uh, my Bird feeder, millet and sunflower seeds has no activity so far. What are some changes to consider? Could the feeder be too close to the house? Um, it could be. Uh, you may want to check I, with your, the Audubon Society had a recommendation and I can't remember what it is right now with how close a feeder should be to a structure. And the reasoning to, for that is it's a way to, if, if your feeder is too far away from the house, you may have more issues with bird strikes on windows. Not something you would normally think of, I know, but it can it can be an issue. Um, so they do recommend there is there is a preferred distance um, away from a structure for that, and I want to say it's like three to five feet maybe because if they if they do get startled and start to fly away and hit the window, they won't get up enough speed to really injure themselves that way. Um, but other issues could be if they don't have any shelter close by. Uh, my bird feeders are surrounded by some evergreen trees so that the birds have shelter. If something startles them, they've got a place where they can go quickly. Um, so providing shelter to them could be um, maybe changing up your seed type. Um, you know, millet and sunflower is generally a pretty good mix. Um, but maybe if you got one with some berries in it, or put up a, a suet feeder nearby. Maybe that would attract them and, and get them to find your feeder more quickly. Um, just, just some ideas on things to try. Sarah wants to know, can the bark butter be put onto deck posts and railings? It can, just remember it's gonna be kind of oily. So 
uh, it may leave a residue on your deck. So you may or may not want to do that. Um, anything to do to attract owls? I have seen screech owl boxes put up, but I don't know how successful they are. Generally, when you provide habitat for everyone, you're providing habitat for everyone. So by putting in your native plants, you attract the pollinators. By attracting the pollinators, you attract the birds. You also give rabbits and chipmunks and other animals a place to be that will in turn then bring their predators. So by having this big healthy ecosystem in your yard, that will attract everybody. That goes for red-shouldered hawks, NOAA, um, owls, everybody. Just by having that healthy ecosystem in your yard. And there are some things you're just never gonna get in your yard, right? If it's somebody who likes deep dark forests and your yard is wide open, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna get those types of birds, but, um, you know, just by providing that habitat for everybody, by making your yard part of the ecosystem, you've got a better chance of getting more things in your yard. All right, let me see how we're doing on time here. All right, we are quite a ways over. So I apologize if I didn't get to your question today. Uh, but please feel free to drop me an email if it's something you are just dying to know. I would be more than happy to answer that for you. Uh, let's stop the share here. There we go. So I want to thank you all for taking time out of your day to spend with me today. I really enjoyed talking birds with you, and I hope you enjoyed it too. So good luck with your bird watching. And hey, if you get some cool pictures, send them to me. I love seeing great pictures of local birds. So Thank you all for joining us today. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.